Don't start. 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 This is, okay. They're asking me to speed up. Which, uh, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Right um, now, first, um, said to, to announce one of the members of this class, um, John Slattery, passed away since the last class. Uh, I don't know if you, you remember John. John was always sitting near the the, uh, the camera over there, volunteered to help. You know, in some of the pro bono cases, um, I understand he died peacefully in his sleep. Um, I, you know, he will be missed. So, jo John Slattery. Um, next, the I, I put on the Google group, and I, I want to remind <coughs> everyone about the tax court judicial conference. Right. The tax court is accepting applications for its judicial conference in Chicago. Uh, Jeff, when is it going to be? In March? No, the, the applications, the deadline is November. The, the conference itself. I'm sorry, 26th to 29th. Is, um, is March. So I know it, it, it cuts into people's return prep season. But the tax court judicial conference is your place to give your comments about how the tax system is. You, you get a couple of days where you, you will spend some time with judges, the government attorneys, uh, taxpayers' counsel. It is really good continuing education. Someone can't hear you in the back, please. All right. Uh, the, the Tax Court Judicial Conference, it's good judicial education, it's good networking, it's, it's a good way to, to say what you think is right and wrong about the system. So I encourage everybody in the class to uh, apply to be accepted to the Judicial Conference. It is by invitation only, so putting an application in does not guarantee you a seat, but um, you know, a fair number of people from here the, who applied last time were accepted and invited to the Judicial Conference. Uh, I think last time the, the, the class was excited, right? They got to meet uh, Justice Scalia before he passed. Um, so again, something I, I really recommend to you all. Uh, you'll, it's a great experience. Uh, the next uh, great experience, calendar calls, right? The next calendar call is November 13th. Uh, the calendar call is with Judge Gale. Judge Gale will be having lunch with the volunteers after the call. Uh, the, the menu is Chinese from Chinatown. The why I'm telling you about November 13th is, um, remember, one of the, the homework assignment or classes has been preparing an innocent spouse case for trial, and three of the volunteers are working and will be uh, preparing an innocent spouse case. Queenie's going to do the opening statement in the innocent spouse case. Queenie, our, our student, and two others. We've been putting the materials um, on the Google group for all of you to read. And for those of you who've been following the case, who, wants to, who want to see how it, it went from beginning to end and how it's going to go through trial, uh, that case is on the November 13th calendar. Um, uh, we're putting together the, the series of classes for 2018 right now. So you, you all have your evaluations. We ask you about the things you want to go on and things you want to learn. Feel free to suggest any topic, a couple of, more than one topic, or more than one person wants a topic. It, it'll probably get covered in one of the classes. And finally, November of 2018 is the next tax court bar exam. Um, for those of you, I, some of you are smiling. I want as many of you who are interested in taking it to take it. Um, and towards that end, right, we're going to have the classes, this material in the Google group. If there's anything you think we can do to, to make it easier for you to pass, uh, we'll do. If you want 
study group time. My office is open on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, for any of you guys who want to put together a study group at the office or who need any individualized classes to get ready for the exam. And we'll announce when we're going to start doing the practice exams. But uh, November 2018, we're a year away. So now we're really going to start studying for the exam. Okay. Next. Of the tonight's topic is about valuation. Right? One of the things in your questions is uh, about it is, well, there's lots of questions you guys ask. If you, most of your questions are tax court, and we're going to talk about tax court, valuation witnesses, expert witnesses, how you can get into that business on your own. But a lot of your questions are not about federal. You've asked lots of questions about real estate cases and valuation in New Jersey tax court. And we're really lucky to have, come on, stand up, Valerie. Valerie used to, uh, she used to um, be a clerk for Judge Andresini of the United States Tax Court. So instead of me talking to you about New Jersey Tax Court and valuations, uh, today Valerie is going to start the first hour and tell you everything you wanted to know about valuation cases, real estate valuation in the New Jersey Tax Court. So Valerie? Clicker is yours. Hi, everyone. I just want to say thank you for coming, despite the weather. I'm very excited to be here for my first presentation, hopefully not my last. Um, so I'm here, like Frank said, to add a dash of salt to tonight's presentation on experts. And the clipper's not. You gotta point it right at the line. Oh. You're you the Can you give us the the uh button? The center? Yeah. Sorry, I haven't done that. Can you go forward and press the right? Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So most people actually don't know that the tax court exists. New Jersey is one of a handful of states that actually has a court that's dedicated only to tax. And it's been around since 1979. Prior to that, cases were handled in superior court. It's a court of limited jurisdiction. And to simplify what I have on the slide, they basically handle two types of cases. The first is cases involving state tax. That is your state income tax, cigarette tax, sales and use taxes. The second type of case is the property tax cases. Listen to the other side's expert, read the other side's report, and help you establish the questions for cross-examination. So your ability to interact with the expert becomes very, very important, all right? So when you're either doing a return, when you are going to an appeals conference, when you're going to trial, you want to kick the tires. That is that is your job as the, as the proponent of the return. You will get the facts and verify any of the facts in the expert report and vice versa, right? The expert's supposed to verify your facts, you're supposed to verify all the facts in the expert report. Having a bad fact in an expert report, a fact that you are unable to prove, a fact that you were unable to get through the stipulation of fact process, means that that report is now going to be discredited. Because how, once you extract that fact, do you know that the conclusions would be the same? All right. Report preparation process, we talked about that. You the report, uh, the report review process, and then there are times when you are going to want your expert to write a rebuttal report. Right? The taxpayer writes a report, the government writes a report. In the bigger cases, the judges will want rebuttal reports. Right? And rebuttal reports are not <coughs> supposed to be advocacy. They're supposed to point out flaws in the logic or the facts relied upon the, by the other expert 
that would support the court's rejection of the other expert's conclusion. All right. And you have to work very hard to get rid of the partisanship and make it a document that allows the trier of fact to evaluate the evidence and come to a conclusion on his or her own. All right. Privileges. All right, we'll, we'll talk about it briefly. I mean, but uh, the cases that always get tested are, you know, we hire an expert. Before we put an expert report into evidence, right, we're going to discuss the case with the expert. Right? You're generally going to hire the expert under a Covell agreement, right? a, an agreement that says, you know, we're going to exchange information. It's still going to be covered by the attorney-client privilege. You're going to give me this information so that I can advise the client and evaluate. The minute I file that expert report, it becomes public. That's a waiver of the privilege. All right. So you, they, when you hire an expert, you've got to decide what you're going to tell them and understand that although the initial work may be covered by attorney-client privilege, there's going to come a time when you're going to need to waive that privilege because you're going to want to rely on it. Second point where waiver becomes important is a client can't use the expert as both a sword and a shield. All right. And when, when does that happen? Um, let's see. Privilege. When you become privilege, then... Uh... Okay. Now, what are we going to go? Where it comes up is, say, I've got a, the, the IRS is a sort of penalty, right? I took a position on, an ex, on my tax return based on the report of an expert or based on the opinion of an expert. The IRS says, hey, please give me a copy of the expert's opinion and or their report. And you want to say, privilege. 7525, or whatever return prepare privilege you want, can you say, I relied on this expert, that's what my return is based on, I wasn't negligent, and then say, I'm asserting privilege, I don't want to give this over. No, you can't use it as a sword and shield. Reliance on an expert requires you to turn over everything that was given by the expert, right? And it's funny, right? Uh, I've seen a number of cases where taxpayers say, I relied on the expert. And then when they asked to produce the report, the expert came out to a different conclusion. Taxpayer just, I, yeah, I hired an expert, I rejected it, and I took a higher value on the return. <coughs> I, so, and, and that's why, one, the, the court and the, the, the government needs to be able to cross-examine. Hey, is this in fact the opinion you gave? What's the basis for the opinion? Did the taxpayer rely on it in good faith? Right? The other problems in reliance on experts to avoid opinions is when the taxpayer doesn't give the expert all of the facts. Right? There's cases where you see an opinion letter, right? Or you see evaluation. And then when you read the facts that were given to the expert, uh, you find out that the taxpayer rigged the report by not giving the expert all of the facts needed to come to the right evaluation <clears throat> conclusion. That's why the three factors are, you know, is the taxpayer, is the expert competent, but then did the taxpayer give the expert all of the facts necessary to render the opinion? Because if you, it's garbage in, garbage out, you could have the best expert on the planet, but if you don't give him or her the materials necessary to render the opinion, then how can you rely on that report for the ultimate conclusion on the tax return, right? That, is, that actually is more indicative of, of culpable conduct and negligence than you should get a penalty if you rid the deck with the expert. So, yes? Uh, two questions. If, if, if you say you get an a, a expert's report and you see weaknesses or holes in it, can you get him to revise that to, to strengthen those areas? And if so, does that come out once you, uh, you know, that, that he can tell about that once you Well, you don't look at, there, there used to be a time where you get drafts, but now the draft tax reports are not turned over. But in the first instance, 
before the expert even puts a draft together, it is your job to talk through the methodology, the facts, and the conclusions, right? You don't want, even if drafts aren't discoverable, you want to talk through the problem with the expert. You want to listen to his or her explanation of the solution for the valuation problem and make sure that the, the one, that they're relying on the facts that you believe to be the facts. And two, that the, the principles are consistent with your understanding of the principles. That should all be done before the first draft is written, right? That's what I'm saying. Working with experts is, is not something that I think the millennials come to naturally, because everybody's used to emails today and exchanging lots of paper. But this is more listening and communication before you put pen to paper, right? It's, it's understanding. The expert teaches you, and you teach the expert, right? By the time of a trial, or the, by the time of an appeals conference, you should know as much about the subject matter as the expert witness that you are proffering on behalf of this taxpayer, right? That's how you can make sure that the expert doesn't make a mistake, and the expert can help you not make a mistake, right? The expert is educating the court as to the proper principles to apply to this valuation problem. Your job is to prove the facts necessary for the court to get to that conclusion. So it is, in essence, a partnership in a way. But you're the only advocate. The, the, the expert loses all utility for you once the court believes that the expert is biased. All right? So the expert has to be above that. Doesn't mean that you're not talking and listening and pointing out errors in their logic. And that's what you're supposed to do, right? You, you listen, you talk, you review what they do as if you were their worst enemy on the planet and make them defend their logic and their rationale and their application of the principles to the fact. To the extent that they're faithful to use fact and the principles that are uniform among experts to get to a conclusion. That's what you want. You want them to teach the court how to get to the conclusion. And it's your job to marshal the facts and present the facts that if you apply them to the principles that the expert says are the guiding principles, gets you to the result that you want. I mean, it's always, in, in ways, it's, it's how do you solve a puzzle? How do you solve a problem? That's what experts are. You know, you, you define the problem, they do the principles, they create the algorithm as it was, and you're putting in the data. Um, so, draft reports are, are now generally privileged and are not going to be turned over. Um, all right. Limitation. What, we, we've now said what the, what the attorney can do. What can you do? All right. And what do attorneys get sanctioned for doing? One, um, you can't draft the expert's report, right? Because then it's not the expert's report, right? Ghost writing, well, do they have that up there? Okay. There is a rule against ghost writing, right? And lawyers are sanctioned for that because you're coming to court and you're saying to the judge, this is an independent expert. We've hired him to assist you. He's not partisan, but you're rewriting their report. All right. The attorney can be sanctioned for that. All right. Um, what else? You know. Actually, there's a lot of software that can detect if you write a green light. It it it's it, it undermines their credibility. It, 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 writing an expert's report is stupid, right? I mean, you got to. It's, it's their way. I mean, look, I speak a certain way. I write a certain way. All right? Anybody who's got software that does deception detection or writing style can figure out who is the author of a, of a document, right? We do that all the time, right? Receptivity. They, there are software programs that were developed by the FBI that are used to, dis, to you know, look at language, 
they can identify, like handwriting, high degree of probability that somebody else wrote something. How many times you use this phrase? That's how you use phrases, how you turn a phrase, and they come up, so they'll look at a, or an expert's report and they'll say, have you got enough other comparable data? And say, 93% probability that this was written by somebody other than this person who was written by the attorney or whoever, right? There's software that helps you do that to do the cross-examinations of experts. Don't, don't underestimate an, expert, uh, uh, an adversary as well-funded as the United States government. They may be complaining about their budgets overall on a big macro side, right? But once you've decided to go to trial, it's like trying a case against SEAL Team 6. I mean, they're going to, right? You, you know, the United States, a lot of people, we can't be anywhere. But once you poke their eye and they send SEAL Team 6 out, you know you got a problem, all right? The, <laughs> You, gotta, you have to have that same strategy when you are trying a case against the United States government. No matter how much money my client has, how aggressive I could be, they could bring out SEAL Team 6. All right? There's, what, 2,000 people in the office of chief counsel? Do you really want every single one of them looking to figure out what the problem is on your case? Again, there is a style and a strategy of trying cases against the United States government. That's why I said it is stupid to write the expert's report. Software will find you out, right? There is, you know, it's, it's much more sophisticated than the plagiarism software that you use if you're a college professor to see if the paper was plagiarized. I mean, deception detection software is much more sophisticated. Very cheap. <laughs> Depending on how sophisticated you want to get, you know, there, there is inexpensive software. Uh, so, again, there are limitations, but the big ones are don't write their reports. Don't tell them what to say, right? Cross-examine them. Let them use their own words. Work your questions with their language. It comes off more credible, right? The, the thing that we try to do is, I try to tape record a witness once, right? do a mock cross, and let him or her look at themselves on a screen. Right? They will see what they're doing that looks like they're being deceptive, right? Deception uh, leaks. And you, you get rid of the tells that are bad. You learn how they want to say it. How are they comfortable saying it? Because you're not hiring somebody who's a boob who doesn't know what they're doing. What you need to do is figure out a way to ask the questions that let your expert shine, that let the judge see that this is the right person to help you solve this problem, judge. Right? That's your job as the narrator for the expert. Right? The finding of facts, you've got a theory of the case, you're going to prove those facts through your witnesses. The expert, you've got to let that person shine. And you got to let them use their language their method of speaking, and just work with them until it is understandable by the trier of fact. Okay, but I'm going now. So, um, experts, things that you have to do, right? Drafts are not discoverable, but there is lots of stuff that is, right? The government does summonses all the time, we will then have our privileges. And there were earlier slides, I'm not gonna go through in this class, attorney-client privilege, work product privilege. And, uh, but what taxpayers forget is they can get the government's expert reports, all right? 7517 lets you get all of the expert reports that were done in estate and gift cases, right? And there are cases where we have found that the government went, got an expert, Report, right? And they wrote other reports, and then until they got to the guy that they wanted to use at trial. All right? Those are great facts, right? 7517 says you can't hold the government to the opinion of the expert that they didn't use. But think about the value of that, either in a mediation or in, in demonstrating that. Hey, how clear cut is it if the government on its own went and got a couple of appraisals and they came out with wildly different conclusions? 
I had a criminal case that was based on evaluation, okay? And the government had, you know, the, the expert that they were giving me to, to try to convince my client to plead said no rational expert on the planet could have come up with the same report as my accounting firm did, all right? And I get it, right? They hired somebody, wrote a really nice report, right? We did our Freedom of Information Act request, and it's called the 7517 request, and see, I had to turn over another report that they had commissioned, and the other report was within 5% of the expert that the government had relied, I mean, the taxpayer had relied upon when he did the return. What do you think the Department of Justice Tax Division did when one, they find out that the IRS CI didn't turn over the first report <coughs> to DOJ tax? And two, that they were basing a criminal tax case on an, a, really a battle of experts and one expert that the government hired was kind of closer to our expert, right? It's important to get the facts, right? Ex um, and, and for the taxpayer to do your 7517 request, your third party contact request, you know, have they logged any third party contacts on a case? Who did they contact, right? Even if you don't get the reports, you want to know who the government has talked to about your tax case. Yeah, the black mark was Information on your free, you know, anything. Even the black marks tell you a lot, right? The fact that they've redacted something means they did something, <laughs> hmm. right? All right that, that means they got a secret. And the government is really not good at keeping secrets. Right? Once I know they're trying to keep a secret, come on. Then you, you've got the Freedom of Information Act request. So there are ways that you should, in every case, try to get the government, discovery from the government on what they're doing with respect to their experts. Okay. Uh, another thing that you should think about is the government employee as the experts. As the government has less and less money, they are using their own valuation engineers more and more at trial. Okay. Now, when we, we talked about the accountant earlier, right? Why wouldn't you use the return prepare? Right? One of the reasons is the guy's biased. He did the return. He or she now has to defend the position he or she took on the return because he signed it on the penalties of perjury and that if it's discredited, there may be a penalty assessed. So there is a bias in favor of the taxpayer that suggests that that's why you don't want to return, use the return preparer also as your expert. On the other hand, the government, don't they have the same bias? They're getting paid by the same people that they're testifying in front of. I mean, it is a matter for cross-examination. It's not a 100% winner because the judges see it all the time and the tax court rules do contemplate that an employee of a party can be used as an expert. But it is something that you do. But there are other things that you gotta push on when you have a government attorney. And what does the government do? Now you saw in the report, I gotta give you every report I've done for the last five years, when I've testified, I've got to turn all that stuff over. The government says, when, you, when they want to call one of their people, you know, we'd love to do that. But, you know, there is that 6103 thing out there. We can't tell you about other taxpayers' cases. You think, that, how do you think that, that should go over, right? You guys were at the government. You want to, any of you want to work on other cases, can you talk about your other cases? No, 6103, right? You, what are you going to say? It's a felony. I can't talk about those other cases, right? Just like the Michael Jackson attorney, right? Let's think. But. <laughs> so I could come on a stand. I could get on a stand. I could talk. I'm going to give you my opinions. You want to cross examine me on my other opinions? I'd love to do it, but it would be a felony. Right. Most of the judges reject that, right? The government, if they put the expert up and they want, they got to, the, their expert has to comply with the same rules that your expert. 
you, they may ask you to sign a protective order limiting the disclosure of the information that they're getting from the other cases. But you should always push for the reports and indicate you will sign a protective order. Because if every report, so because I had an evaluation case where they had to turn over the reports. And it seemed like the government expert always came in at zero, right? That it was charitable contributions. This, ex this expert, the government expert, was an expert on the value of property contributed to charity. So they're gonna put him up. And he was valuing properties contributed to charity. So he got his other reports. And no matter what was contributed to charity, he had one conclusion. It was zero, right? The mean of all his reports, it was zero. The median, it was zero. The high, zero, low, zero, right? So, <laughs> how credible does, his, he, does he seem that if no matter what the answer is, when a taxpayer contributed something to, to charity, it was zero, right? If the government hadn't, if the judge hadn't ordered the government to turn over those other reports, which would, they had fallen, we would never have been able to show that, hey, this one of his reports have no credibility. He's hired because he always comes to zero. Um, so you want to do that. The other thing that the government will always fight you on is the employee's personnel file. Right? When you are putting an expert on, if there are any reports or complaints about that expert, you've got to turn them over. Right? It's fair cross-examination. All of the stuff, it's fair game. It's fair games for cross-examination. Compensation is fair game for cross-examination. Yes? What, what did you say that is signed um, if they, for IRC 603? Uh, some type of... Um... Oh, confidentiality order. Oh, okay. Remember that one, uh, rule 103 right there are. The tax court can put in confidentiality orders to protect the legitimate need for any party, including the IRS, for confidentiality. So you can get that material and agree to a reasonable confidentiality order to get to be able to use it in court and cross-examine the taxpayer. Just like in a whistleblower case where, hey, if you, the identity of the whistleblower came out, it would be dangerous for the taxpayer's life. So there are many cases you'll see in the advance sheet where we say in re anonymous because we can't give the taxpayer's name. There are protective orders that are done that promote the need for the party for confidentiality but the need for the court to have the facts to get to the truth. So the other thing where the government is always going to push back is the employee's personnel files, right? Because they, the unions are saying, you know, that's confidential. And why are you putting the employee's life on trial? I mean, there's a lot that goes into a personnel file. But on the other hand, when I'm putting an expert on, if I'm putting them on the stand and there are complaints about that expert, I've got to turn those over. So that if the government wants the court to evaluate the credibility of their purported expert, they need to turn over the personnel file. And what happens in the government, the government actually gets though something that you don't usually get when you're in private practice, and that's an in-camera review. You need to make a motion and then the judge is going to review the personnel file and, make, and, and evaluate whether or not there's anything in there that you could use for legitimate cross. So if there are, um, and you've got to hope that the judge looks at the personnel file in private and gives you a fair look, right? I, we've had cases where there was a personnel file where other taxpayers had made complaints about the experts' methods and over-aggressiveness. Right. So those the judge turned over, because if there had been complaints about the taxpayers, the, the experts' methodology before, that would be relevant, that this was consistent with a pattern of, of undervaluing charitable gifts. So it is important to, in these cases, even the playing field, right? It should never become a battle of experts, but if we're going to go down that road, 
it shouldn't be that the government gets to dirty up your expert and theirs gets on the stand without a similar rigorous of, of cross-examination. All right. Valuation trials and burdens of proof. How does this work? And the, the circuits all come up to different rules, right? General burden of proof. Taxpayer has the burden of proof. In most cases, all right, what does the court look at? De novo review. So the common sense answer to the question is, if the taxpayer has to prove the value of every item on the return. Some judges, on the other hand, um, have their own little spin, right? A state of Thompson. The judge does the judge have to accept one report or another report? No. A state of Thompson. That court said, look, the judge takes everything in. The experts are advisors, but the judge makes the ultimate decision, right? Said so, because the theory is that experts only advise the judge as to the principles to apply, that it's the judge's job to get to the ultimate conclusion. All right? But then there is my favorite, a state of Elkins, where the, uh, the IRS uh, didn't put an expert on and the taxpayer did. So the judge in Elkins said, hey, you know, I probably sat through 100 valuation trials. I could look at the facts. And I could value it, and I don't need to accept the government, the taxpayer's expert, even if the government doesn't put an expert on, because this is the search for the truth. I've looked at the facts, I know the principles. The truth is, it's valued differently than the government, the taxpayer's expert. And Court Malkin said, hey, judge, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> government didn't put on an expert, you gotta take the taxpayer's expert, at, that's the value you gotta use. That's an outlier. But if you're in the Seventh Circuit, or wait, it was the Fifth Circuit, you should know about Alkins. And then Morrissey and Mitchell, again, favorite cases that I like, is, but again, we're not in California, if I move, but that would make me move to California. Um, IRS has a notice of deficiency. Right? They use one of their in-house experts. Then, case goes to trial, they say, hey, you know, there's too much money here. We're not gonna use an in-house guy. We're gonna go out and hire a different expert. Now, they hired a different expert, and he came out with a different opinion, lower than the notice of deficiency. All right? IRS still says, hey, we're doing a good thing here. You, you know how honest we are? We got a different expert. He came out lower. So, you know, we're going to give you, taxpayer, the benefit of that doubt. In the Ninth Circuit, hey, you did a notice of deficiency with one number. Your experts now, they came up with another number. The whole notice of deficiency is out. Because you yourself proved that your notice of deficiency was wrong. That's why I tell you, I love the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> no, those, that's the circuit court. That's two cases. I mean. So we're going to move all our valuation cases to LA. <laughs> <laughs> Have you read the Cole case, Cole versus Sierra? Which, you mean which case? K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-N-K-O-
because if I give you the records, you're going to be able to prosecute me for the non-tax crime, selling marijuana. So you know how you're going to figure out what my income is? You're going to pick up what I got, you know, what I spent, the, 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 my income side. But for, I'm going to use an expert to do the deduction side of the cost of goods sold. So government, if you say I got a dollar in income, I really don't have a dollar in income because you know I have 60 cents of cost of goods sold because everybody in the marijuana business has 60 cents of cost of goods sold. So I only have 40 in income. The judge, well, in this case, and this is a bad case because the, the, the expert did everything wrong, but instead of looking at industry databases, we talked about you know, what do reasonable experts do? They look at broad-based databases like BizStat. I, there were databases, if you look at the tax court cases, that the tax court has said these are reliable databases experts could look at. You can make opinions based on uh, the application of facts to the statistics in these databases. It has um, to be an access to the reality. You can't just go got, and take it out in, well, in the table. You know, you have to go and... It's also got to be verifiable. So what the expert in Feinberg said, you know, there aren't these databases for the marijuana business that are reliable because people have been, you know, for years it's been an illegal business. So there, there's no reliable third-party databases out there. So. I'm going to tell you that this is the number based on my experience preparing returns for marijuana growers. So it's my own personal private database. Okay. So at, how do you ver how does the government verify? Well, you can't verify because they're my clients and they're not going to tell you who my clients are. Uh, so in, in, the, in the expert report, doesn't give you enough facts, right? They didn't have facts. The, the applications weren't verifiable. You wouldn't have the scientific method. I'm not going to make estimates of expenses. I'm not going to let you use this expert report to estimate the, the expenses or the cost of goods sold for a taxpayer. Whereas in, in Huzella, the taxpayer was able to testify. He didn't take the fifth. He got on. He made estimates based on his knowledge and belief, right? Lay opinion, right? But sometimes lay opinion can be as informed as expert opinion. For example, there's always been testimony in cases about, can you testify about the value of your own house? Yes, because it's, it's a fact that would be within your knowledge. You know, it's, it's obviously subject to cross-examination for bias, and you can be cross-examined in your ability to understand these facts. But lay opinion comes in when you are, in essence, an expert as to your own return. Okay. So in the Hezbollah, the, the judge allowed estimates in based on, on listening to the taxpayer, finding that the taxpayer's facts were credible, and then applying the Cohen rule that the court can make estimates, the court can, can make these expert judgments based on what they see in evidence. Iridium is up there in the same thing. There, there's two cases up there, we're going to end on Iridium, that sometimes you can try your case without an expert if the value to be added to the ex by the expert is junk science, right? Iridium and Campbell talk about there are very hard, some assets are very hard to uh, value. So the opinion of the expert doesn't add anything to the equation because there's no similar comp. The, the, the judge is going to take the facts and apply the generally accepted principles. Like Iridium involved a satellite network, right? There was no other satellite network. What are the comps? What are the other valuations? You know, is the cost method there? Is the income method there? Is the other methods there? Those facts were going into evidence. The judges said, in that case, the experts can't tell me anything that I don't already know. Those facts are in evidence. And I, the guidance, because there is no comparables, and this is the first time anybody's ever tried it, is of no value to me. Right? Very controversial, because there, there are some people say, 
But if you're not in this business, you should talk to people that are. All right, you can accept or reject, but expert testimony may be valid. But what these cases, has a look, F, the FB say, that these, you can try some of these cases without the expert if you have enough fact witnesses to allow you to make the arguments yourself, right? At the end of the day, all valuation is a question of fact. The purpose of the expert is to assist that trier of fact. But if you've got other facts and evidence, you may not need the expert. All right, what we're, I'm going to break now because we're not going to go through, um, well, you know what, I just want to go through. Cross-examination. Experience, bias, inconsistent position in uh, publications, and then you end with the reasonableness of their assumptions. You take their assumptions out to the logical extreme. You don't need to beat the experts up. Um, and that, that's it. I mean, there's, the, the materials are great. For those of you taking the exam, you will see that there are questions on the exam uh, with respect to expert testimony and procedure, the rules, in penalties, in the rules of evidence, how to get them in, and in ethics on conflicts of interest. So valuation, experts, forensic testimony, in the real world, very practical. There's more of it. 20% of the cases that are tried now involve valuation and expert testimony. So it is a growth area in tax, and it is something that you're going to know for those of you taking the exam. Thank you very, very much. Please read the